it's my birthday and to celebrate my 23rd year of life i wanted to release this special birthday bonus episode in which i'll be sharing three eating disorder behaviors that were actually my autistic traits. So if you've listened to my episode on how to tell the difference between an eating disorder behavior and autistic trait, you probably heard me mention that I would be releasing an episode in which I shared 13 ED behaviors that are actually autistic traits. I was originally going to share 23 traits because I'm 23 now, but I quickly realized that would be overdoing it just slightly, and so I decided to just share 13 traits. But then I started outlining the written version of this episode that you're listening to right now, which, by the way, if you didn't already know, all of my podcast episodes are also available as blog posts over on my website at livelabelfree.com, so if you prefer reading any of my content, you can head over there. Um, But anyways, after I started sharing three traits for this episode, we were like literally already over 3,000 words, so I realized that if I pursued the entirety of my original plan being 13 traits, we would end up with a novel. (laughs) And I mean, I'm already releasing a novel coming up pretty soon my memoir my book (laughs) so today I've just decided to stick with three traits but before you think you're going to miss out on the remaining 10 don't you worry my friend I have loads of fun and creative ways in which I'm going to weave all 13 traits and it's probably going to turn into 23 traits and beyond because the interconnection between autism and eating disorders is just infinite um so i'm going to weave all of that into more future content from courses to books and more podcasts so be sure to subscribe wherever you are watching or listening follow me on instagram over at live label free and join my newsletter to stay tuned on everything that is coming and just before we dive into today's episode i want to give you something for free and that is my audio training three steps to recovery from an eating disorder as an autistic person in this training i guide you through three steps that you can take action on today that will give you the clarity and confidence you need to use your autistic traits to your advantage in eating disorder recovery. It's a super practical step-by-step 45-minute training that's honestly like a private coaching session with me on demand. So trust me, you are not going to want to miss it. To listen to the training, simply head over to livelabelfree.com forward slash free dash audio training. So that's livelabelfree, like the name of this podcast, dot com forward slash free dash audio training and you'll be on your way to taking the first steps on your unique path to full recovery. I cannot wait for you to gain insight and make progress and now without further ado let's get into today's episode. Welcome to Live Label Free the podcast where we talk about all things eating disorder recovery autism, entrepreneurship, and so much more. I'm your host, Livia Serra, and my mission is to inspire individuals from across the globe to live a life in which they feel fulfilled and free from limiting labels. I am so excited to have you here and cannot wait to dive into the episode. If you've listened to previous episodes of this podcast and as you'll read in my upcoming book, You know, I am a firm believer in the idea that my eating disorder was a manifestation of undiagnosed autism. My eating disorder masked my being autistic for almost a decade, and I believe it was the very lack of recognition for underlying autism that contributed to the prolonged duration of my illness, not to mention the prolonged and unnecessary suffering of many, many undiagnosed autistic individuals who unfortunately 
develop eating disorders because of the under recognition. Anyways, I was tossed in and out of treatment for years, acting as the perfect patient every time I went into treatment, telling the therapists what I had learned they wanted to hear, I mean, another form of masking now come to think of it, and manipulating the system in any way possible, all just so I could get out, then spiral back into weight loss and eating disorder behaviors as soon as I got out. No one could figure out why all the therapists, nutritionists, and psychologists weren't helping me get better. After all, they were the professionals, right? Now, looking back at what was almost seven years in and out of traditional treatment through an autistic lens, for reference, I discovered I'm autistic at the age of 20, I completely understand why treatment only made my eating disorder worse. The professionals were trying to rid me of my autistic traits, and before we get into three of those traits, I want to read you a passage from my upcoming book. It's actually one of my favorite passages from my book because I think it beautifully illustrates what a negative impact traditional treatment approaches can have on individuals who are autistic. So, here goes. For years, treatment providers attempted to heal my eating disorder by attacking my autistic traits. I was told that recovery meant eating different foods every day, being okay with unpredictability, and learning to eat without a set structure. I was told that my preference for certain temperatures and textures was rooted in the eating disorder, and that I would only be fully recovered once I gave up those desires. I was told that my obsession for color coordinating my foods to match was my eating disorder talking, and that my literal perception of health claims was my disordered brain taking over. But what if all these wants, these needs, had nothing to do with an eating disorder? What if all of these characteristics were simply autistic traits that had manifested as a problem with food and exercise? Because I was told to get rid of the very parts of myself that were intrinsically mine, I felt invalidated and alone. I didn't understand why recovery seemed so impossible. I mean, I wanted it bad enough. Yet, the more I tried to fit the mold of what I believed recovery to be, an ideal inflicted upon me by the external world, the more out of control I felt. And the more out of control I felt, the more I wanted to hold on to the very thing I'd held on to since the age of 11. If you want to read my full story and be the very first to read my book and receive exclusive pre-launch gifts, be sure to get on my book waitlist by visiting the link livelabelfree.com forward slash book. I seriously hold nothing back in my upcoming memoir and I'm just beyond excited for you to read it. So now circling back into today's episode, as I just described in that passage, the very focus on eliminating those characteristically autistic traits such as the need for predictability, difficulty with change, preference for visual order, and literal mindedness actually made me hold on to the very thing that led me to cope with feeling invalidated in the first place, which was obviously my eating disorder. As autistic people, we're often told that we're too sensitive and that we're picky eaters and that we're emotionless and rude and often that we only think about ourselves. I'm not even going to go into why all of these labels couldn't be further from the truth because that's a whole nother rabbit hole of discussion, but my point is that these are all labels placed upon us by the external world, labels we cannot control. We cannot control others' perception of us, and because autistic people do tend to have difficulty understanding social cues, we often mask even harder to play it safe and do everything we can to ensure other people like us, or as I used to say, make sure people don't hate me. (laughs) Lots of black and white thinking going on there, which I'm very excited to announce. I'm currently working on an upcoming podcast episode all about the science behind black and white thinking in autism and anorexia. 
Anyways, this lack of control over our external circumstances, which basically comes down to it just being impossible to meet our needs in a neurotypical world that wasn't built for us, is what causes us to cling to things we can control. And what's the easiest thing there is? Bingo! How we eat and how we move. We all eat and move on an everyday basis, so logically, it makes complete sense that food and exercise are such common control mechanisms and, I guess, drug of choice, so to say. Some people may turn to alcohol or actual drugs or sex, but if you look at when most eating disorders develop, it's at quite a young age, and the only thing you really have control over as a kid is how you eat and how you move. So I, like so many other people I've met with eating disorders, did just that. I made a plan to follow the perfect diet and follow the perfect exercise regimen so I could, or so I thought, live a perfect life. Years later, I understand nothing is perfect, so this plan of mine was a recipe for disaster. But at least my journey to recovery was the very thing that led me to my greatest discovery, and that is being autistic. This entire journey has brought me to where I am today, which is guiding other neurodivergent individuals to full recovery from an eating disorder through a tailored, 100% individualized approach. Recovery from an eating disorder as an autistic person will look very different than it does for a neurotypical person because we are simply wired differently. And now I'm going to be giving three examples of that different wiring and unpack three traits that need to be considered when tailoring recovery to your autism because the traits I'm about to share are just a mere three of many traits every professional told me I had to get rid of if I wanted to fully recover from my eating disorder. Let's get into it. Alrighty, so my very first autistic ED trait is attaching numbers to food and exercise, and this would be in the form of counting calories, exercising for a certain amount of time or distance, weighing and measuring my food, eating at certain times, and honestly, there are just countless, no pun intended, ways in which I attached numbers to food, exercise, and my life in general. The latter being said, I have always attached numbers to parts of my life. At school, this manifested as a hyperfixation on grades. In sports, this manifested as a score. And even now, I'm super protective of the amount of hours I sleep and I count my pieces of clothing when I'm folding laundry. I don't know if anyone else does this. And I always brush my teeth for a minimum amount of seconds. Again, Let me know on Instagram by sending me a DM at LiveLabelFree if you do this too. Eating and moving are things we humans need to do every day. So, of course, this tendency to count would manifest into those parts of my life as well. Why it eventually turned into an eating disorder was because it came to a point where I was no longer in control and my health was put at risk. But I do want to emphasize that you can be fully recovered from an eating disorder as an autistic person and still attach numbers to food and exercise in some sense. For example, having a set eating schedule can actually be really beneficial for autistic people because we tend to struggle with hunger cues due to interoceptive difficulties. Furthermore, attaching a minimum number of calories to meals and snacks can be another way to use this autistic trait to your advantage in recovery because it gives you a reason to challenge your fear of eating more in a way that aligns with your autistic desire for that number attachment. And then with movement and exercise, instead of trying to hit a minimum number of steps each day, set a maximum for yourself. Long story short, the trait of attaching numbers to food and exercise does not exclusively have to be tied to eating disorder because it can equally be used as a strength to recover. My second autistic trait that I was told was solely an eating disorder behavior is arranging food in a certain way. Think color coordinating food items, make it, making sure they don't touch, and even today I tend to use lots of little plates, different bowls, and different utensils. 
Ever since I was a child, I was a very picky eater and had strong preferences for the way my food looked and was presented to me. I believe this is strongly tied to the anatomy of the autistic brain in the sense that we think in pictures and in visuals. To comprehend and literally get a clear picture of what was in front of me, ranging from food to facts I had to learn in school, I needed to arrange the items in a way that I could see them as separate entities. When food is all mixed up, my brain has a hard time processing the information and this can put me into a state of anxiety and thus make it harder for me to eat due to being in fight, flight, or freeze mode. In traditional treatment, I was forced to become comfortable with eating food that wasn't presented in my preferred way because my need for perfection was my eating disorder talking. However, the more I forced myself to do something that was not aligned with the way my brain worked, the more anxious I felt. And thus, the more I wanted to cling to the control mechanism I'd clung to for years. So again here, instead of trying to get rid of your desire for visual order, experiment with how you can use this autistic trait to your advantage in recovery. Try making your food look like a work of art and incorporate fear foods into your masterpiece. Recipe development and food photography was a huge part of this process on my own journey to full recovery from an eating disorder and as I'm saying that, I also want to share with you that I'm currently working on a recipe ebook all about nourishing neurodiversity and there's a ton of tips in there from executive functioning tips and how to support your gut health and I highlight why certain ingredients and certain recipes are beneficial for mental health and I even have like a huge kind of database of customizations and how you can adjust the recipes to your specific um, taste preferences. So I'm very, very excited to um, release that recipe ebook very soon along with my own memoir book and I'm like also currently working on like 10 other books at the same time um so yeah be sure to um follow me on instagram over at live label free and be sure that you're on my email list and you can get on that over at livelabelfree.com so that you'll be updated and stay up to date on all the latest um and all the books coming out because I mean I'm so, so passionate about what I do and I can't wait to bring all the things into the world. So anyways, with all that said, my third autistic trait that was considered an eating disorder behavior is wanting to eat with certain utensils and crockery, which is somewhat tied to my last trait in which I mentioned eating with lots of separate bowls and utensils. When I was in the thick of my eating disorder, or should I say the thin of it, I was obsessed with learning about all the latest diet tips, tricks, and hacks. One of these quote-unquote hacks was using smaller bowls and plates to eat off of because visually you could make your food look like more. In line with this hack, I also learned that eating with smaller utensils would ensure you took smaller bites, which would prolong the eating experience. And when you're restricting, prolonging the eating experience becomes a serious skill. When I committed to full recovery from my eating disorder, I had to relearn proper portions. Scratch that. I didn't have to relearn proper portions, I just had to learn them. I think this learning experience can be very difficult and overwhelming for individuals who did develop their eating disorders at a young age like I did because we have no history or touch points of what our life was like before our eating disorder. Because we then are much older and just at later stages of life when we become aware of our illness actually being an illness and actually commit to getting better, we're often no longer in an environment in which quote-unquote normal ways of eating can be demonstrated or shown to us. Despite all the drawbacks of traditional treatment for autistic individuals, I must say that this modeling was one of the few aspects of treatment that was helpful for me. When I first willingly entered treatment and had decided I would do anything and everything it took to recover from the illness that almost killed me, I almost got a heart attack when I saw the size of my first meal. In my eyes, it was way too much, but that label was simply based on my frame of reference at that time. 
a frame of reference that was completely distorted by my eating disorder. Anyways, after consistently practicing and learning to eat portions of food that sufficiently nourished my body, I became aware of how disordered my patterns of using dessert spoons and mini ramekins for everything truly was. However, after I had restored my weight and returned back home, I noticed my desire for using the same bowls, the same plates, and the same utensils and cutlery had not dissipated. I no longer felt the urge to use the smallest spoons or plates or bowls anymore, but I did always want to use the same ones. As I wondered why this was, I figured a part of the reason was because all the plates and bowls and cutlery in the treatment center were the same. It's something I never got the chance to quote unquote work on, which was why my treatment team advised me to challenge these ED behaviors after care. But no matter how hard I tried, no matter how hard I forced myself to switch things up, I only noticed my anxiety get worse and thus it became more difficult to eat. When I finally was able to view my life through an autistic lens, this difficulty finally made sense. My desire to use the same items was simply a manifestation of my desire for predictability and routine, one of my core autistic traits. In the end, I believe this desire for predictability and routine simply comes down to trust. As humans, we trust what we know. Just as darkness is the absence of light, distrust is simply the absence of knowledge. Autistic people have so many routines in place because it gives us a sense of trust and control in a world that is so difficult to trust because most things are out of our control. So just as we rely on our never-changing morning or evening routine, or rely on the comfort of the clothes we've come to love, or rely on the predictability of the experience that comes with eating from a certain bowl with a certain spoon. This doesn't have to be an eating disorder behavior, because as with the two aforementioned traits, you can use your knowledge of this desire to challenge your eating disorder, so using the trait to your advantage in recovery. For example, use the same bowl you always do, then fill that bowl with a few food and challenge your eating disorder in that way. Combining something unknown and thus something you don't yet trust, in this case the experience of eating the few food, with something you do trust, in this case the bowl, you are making it easier for yourself to overcome an obstacle. In recovery, and this is often the approach with traditional treatment, we often think we need to challenge all the things at once, but this can be so overwhelming for neurodivergent individuals that you are then plunged into analysis paralysis and then end up not doing anything at all. This doesn't get you anywhere and only discourages you because you feel like you're not capable and this is also the reason why I believe so many autistic individuals are eventually tossed out of the treatment system and labeled as too complex just like I was. But my friend, you are not too complex. You just need an individualized approach. The core of the work I do with my clients in one-on-one -on -one coaching is mapping out a recovery plan that aligns with your unique lifestyle and preferences, then breaking that plan down into clear, measurable, and realistic action steps. Living a life that's free of an eating disorder doesn't happen overnight. It took time for your disordered beliefs to ingrain themselves, so it'll take time for your brain to create new neural connections that support the life you want to live. To achieve that life, the key is taking small, consistent action steps over time. This way, you build confidence and motivation, which makes for sustainable recovery. And isn't sustaining your recovery the very thing you want? And that is all I have for you today, my friend. If you loved this episode and want to support all the free value I provide on this podcast, I would like to invite you to become a Live Label Free Patron. Creating this podcast and everything else I do to serve you takes a lot of time and energy. And as much as I wish it did, 
free content doesn't pay the bills. So for as little as $5 a month, you can support me on Patreon, which allows me to continue doing what I love most. And that is providing you with as much possible value. Simply head over to livelabelfree.com forward slash Patreon. So Patreon spelled P-A-T. R E O N and donate however much or as little as you feel my free content is worthy of to you. Plus, it's my birthday, so consider it your gift to me. I'll be back soon with way more value, including those remaining 10 traits, so stay tuned and I'll catch you in the next episode. Bye bye for now! Ajar, if you're hearing my voice right now, you are stuck in eating disorder recovery and desperately want to recover but don't know where to start due to feelings of fear and overwhelm. And this podcast is here to help with that. On this feed, I do my very best to share everything I've learned on my own journey to guide you through the scary process. But let's face it, it would take me years to share every piece of research I find or every recovery strategy I have here via free podcast episodes. And the thing is, you've been struggling with an eating disorder for long enough and you cannot afford to spend more time merely surviving at the mercy of its grasp on you. So if you're committed to getting your life back, or should I say, discovering the life you were meant to live, I highly recommend you book a coaching session with me or 12 as I currently offer a 12 week coaching program and after many, many, many requests, I also offer single sessions so you can book however many of those as you may need and together we will work on shifting your mindset. We will create a roadmap of the life in which you're living to your highest potential and we'll come up with action steps that are feasible for you and your life because nothing is worse than feeling overwhelmed. So we'll come up with the exact steps that you need to take to achieve that dream life of yours because in the end, you've only got one life. Simply come visit me over at livelabelfree.com and I'll see you on the other side, my friend.